you for one text, and I don't want to go to a second place. And in the message tonight, I want to talk first to the church, then I want to close out talking to anyone that's here that may not yet have accepted Jesus Christ on the terms of the gospel. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, and verses 9 and 10. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. And honor preferring one to another. And then, I'd like to go over to the book of Galatians. In the book of Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And then he goes on to say, Who loved me and gave himself for me. It's been called the greatest thing in all the world. The topic that I've chosen to talk about tonight is just a little abstract noun, just a little abstract concept, yet it's the very essence of Christianity. It is the power that brought those two young ladies to accept Christ last night. The very essence of, the, of Christianity, the power I'm talking about tonight. It is the most powerful force on planet Earth. Yet I, I'm going to say something to you now. This power uh, is not something that's natural to man. Man cannot produce it under his own power. Man can only experience this power. If this power were allowed to reign in the hearts of men... It would solve all delinquency problems. It would solve all marital problems. And all church divisions would end. It would unite parents with children. To have the experience that I'm talking to you tonight. I'm talking about the love of God. To have that experience is to drink of the wine of heaven. I believe that we had a young girl last night this year drink of the wine of heaven last night. It's a word we use freely, but all too often in reality we don't practice it. It is the evidence of true salvation. And you, who are the older members, we have a young convert. You know, the Bible talks about uh, Apostle, uh, or, uh, Jesus Christ, that all power is given to him under heaven and earth in Matthew chapter 28. And, and he gave us the great commission to go forth and conduct revivals and to seek souls and to win souls for him. And you know what? All too often we only do one half of the great commission. That's right. One half of the great commission says this. Jesus said, uh, All power is given to me under heaven and earth. Go therefore and, and, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We do that part. But the other half of the Great Commission says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's the part we lack up on. And one of the greatest things we need to teach our young converts is the fact that love is the evidence of true salvation. That's right. Love for the brethren. In John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Oh, many, many churches throughout this land and country do not have revivals because they don't have the love one to another. The world comes in and they don't see any love. They have to see something different about you and about me. 
There could be no revival in a church without true love. In 1 John chapter 3, 14, the Bible says, We know that we have passed unto life, uh, from death unto life because we have loved the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now, I read to you out of the book of Romans. The book of Romans is that uh, Apostle Paul's masterpiece. And uh, chapters 1 through 11, and to the young lady that accepted Christ last night. That whole discourse right there, chapters 1 through 11, the Apostle Paul is defending one thing, one teaching that he's defending, and that is that the doctrine of justification by faith. Now there's someone who will probably tell you, that's all you did? <laughs> that's all you did? You just accepted Jesus Christ and... And you, well, you've got to do this and you've got to do... Let me tell you, you did all that you needed to do last night. You're heaven-bound just by professing Christ with all your heart believing. Amen. Chapter 12, where I, I chose the text, though, begins the practical side of the book of Romans, the Christian duties. The Apostle Paul instructs us to love without dissimulation. That word right there, without dissimulation means to love without hypocrisy. I have actually witnessed it. People go over and they go, uh, the tag? And, 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 you know, and they don't have any love at all. Behind, and they're talking behind their back. And, and, and then they tell them, I love you. And then behind their back, you see, kills revivals, doesn't it? I'm talking to the church first. I'll talk to the uh, unsaved here in a little while. So he's talking about love that is not a pretended love, love that's not a fake love, love that's not a feigned love. He wants an unfeigned love, love that's genuine. I want the young lady to know you've come to a church today. You've made a profession of faith, and we hope that you will join our church and be baptized because you've joined a church that really loves you. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 13 the Apostle Paul made a, a long discussion he compared and I like the way he did it he compared and contrasted love he compared and contrasted love and what he did is he says all right this is what love does and this is what love doesn't do it's interesting that do is the key word in the word love and analyzing love. In fact, he doesn't use the word love in chapter 13 of uh, Corinthians. He uses the word charity, which is really love put in action. That's why do is the key word there. I believe that's why a lot of times churches don't have revivals. It's because there's no love really being put in action. True love is manifest and manifested in acts of kindness and in deeds. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. John says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I want you to know that love bestows honor. True love doesn't say, What can I get out of church? True love says, What can I do for my sister or my brother in Christ? True love bestows honor. I'll say it one more time. True love bestows honor. Does not seek honor. Let's take a look at what Paul analyzes about that word love. In verse 4 of that chapter, he says this is what love does. Love suffereth long and is kind. May I say this? I pastored this church for a long time, 10 years or so. And there's one thing I learned, Brother Richard, and one thing I've learned about school teaching. You know, it's amazing how much teaching school and preaching and pastoring and, 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 and church work is so much like school. It's absolutely amazing how much they're like. You know why they're like? Because you're dealing with people, and people never change, you see. Uh, people do change, but I'm not talking about it. Sometimes it takes a long time. 
And one thing we have to do when he says suffer long and it's kind, he's talking about love is patient. Love is patient with your brethren and your sisters. It does not retaliate in haste. It is not anxious to punish. Love is kind and considerate. It's the exact opposite of anger. In Romans chapter 5, verse 5, the Apostle Paul said, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to, unto us for it. I dare say that the young lady that accepted Christ, and probably the other young lady, probably wanted to go, I want to tell you what has happened to me. I, Sister Karen, I bet, I bet you wanted to tell people after you, I want to tell you what's happened to me. Because you love people. You want them to experience this wonderful salvation, this oh so great salvation. You want them to come to know the Jesus that you know. When you have that kind of love, that's evidence that you've been born again. So it suffereth long and it's kind. May I say this? I said about going about pastor. Uh, I had I had to learn patience, Brother Jay. I had to learn patience. I had to learn patience as a teacher. I had to learn patience as a husband. I have a perfect wife. I know I do. Well, perfect for me. But I probably, you know, quarreled at her some. You know, you know what I'm saying? You know how little things come up, and you know, I didn't shut the dresser drawers. And, you know, she, these little things. You don't talk about. I had to learn to fall in love all over again. Not, I'm sure all, you didn't have to do that, did you, Brother Richard? I understand what you okay. All right, now listen. So I was saying, I wasn't very patient. <laughs> then one day I read this poem. And it made me realize something. How much the, my wife was being patient with me. And how much my church members were being patient with me. You know, I wasn't patient with them. I didn't think about my own faults and shortcomings and how much they were overlooking my faults and shortcomings. But this little poem goes like this. I dreamed death came the other night and heaven's gates swung wide. Swung wide, I should have read it right. An, a an, an angel with a halo bright ushered me inside. And there, to my astonishment, stood folks I judged and labeled as quite unfit, of little worth, and spiritually disabled. Indignant words rose to my lips, but never were set free, where every face showed stunned surprise, for no one expected me. We need to realize that how patient they're being with us. So love suffers long and is kind. Another thing, one thing that he says in verse 4 that love does not do, love cherieth, uh, uh, love envieth not, charity envieth not, which means it's not jealous. It does not think... Uh, oneself superior in wisdom or spirituality or knowledge. Uh, in the book of James, if you will turn over there with me for just a moment. In the book of James chapter 3 verse 17, the Bible says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure and then peaceful and gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good uh, fruits without partiality, without Hypocrisy. I don't know. Actually, I had a preacher say to me one time, I don't know why people say this, I was talking about actually a, a member of, of someone in this family, you know, a, a related person to someone in this church. And, and, and I said, you know, you probably need to go over and talk to that man about Christ. And, and this preacher actually said to me, man, you're just wasting your time with him. He is hardcore. Let me tell you something, Christ died for him too. Amen. What love was this man showing this man? So I've talked to him. Or some uh, poor person comes in the church and, uh, you know, 
<laughs> we're saying, oh my goodness, that's Joe Bob McCorncob. My gosh, he's a hayseed from way back. And let me tell you something. Christ died for him too. What if a black family came into this community and entered into this church? Would they be welcome? Would we show them the kind of love? I certainly hope so, because Christ died for them too. Another thing that he says love does not do, love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, you see. So we don't envy, we're not jealous. Another thing in verse 5 he said that love does not do, love does not behave itself unseemly. In other words, you don't see bad manners. Church, we need to make sure we set these things before these young converts. Beha it, love does not behave in bad taste. Love never acts in an ugly way. In verse 5, he says that love does do this. Love, uh, charity, uh, he said, love seeketh not around. In other words, what he's saying there uh, is that uh, we don't necessarily always want to serve our self-interest. It's got to be my way. You know, Brother Richard told me a story once. I hope you don't mind me using this. About a man, and they had a dispute over 14 inches of the way that I think it was 14 inches, or anyway, it was way a block for the basement and so on. And the, and they didn't do it the way he wanted it, and he just left the church. And all his kids and all his grandkids haven't been in church, and then they're going to, you know, not hear the gospel. Love, true love, doesn't seek to get your own way all the time. Another thing, he says, love is not easily provoked. It's not stirred up to bitterness. There's no spirit of anger when wronged. In verse 5, he says this, Charity thinketh no evil. In that verse, in, in that verse, there's a word there, to reckon. It means it does not harbor resentment. There's no malice. It forgives when no apology was issued. No apology is asked for, and they forgiven in. He goes on to say, in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's something that love does. Love, true love, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. In other words, find no joys in the wrongdoing of others. True love expresses itself in truth. In other words, when you see one of your members that's not doing something right, you tell them. You say, a Christian does not behave that way. But you do, of course, do it in a nice way. In verse 7, Apostle Paul said that love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That word to bear there means to support and cover. In other words, it protects. And then too, when it says believeth all things, and we're not talking about being naive here. But we're talking about uh, making a choice to believe that which is best and not to be constantly suspicious of your brethren. And then he says love. He says about love, charity, which he called it, never faileth. That means that when you have true love, it never ceases to be in, uh, active. It's never inactive. It's always an active thing. I want to tell the church tonight, I'm talking to the church for a while, but I am going to get to talk here to any unsaved that might be here in this little bit. In our affluent society, man, at Christmas time comes around, and, or birthdays, or anniversaries, and we ponder, what can we give someone? And I say to you, give them your love. I'll tell you a true story. I first came across this story, famous story, it's been printed numerous times, maybe you've heard it. Famous true story, of course it's always in educational magazines because it's basically an educational story, but it fits to what I'm talking about. 
And uh, I, if you haven't heard it, I hope it blesses you. Teddy Stoddard was a young boy in the fifth grade at a particular school in America. And to say, the, to say in a nice way, Teddy's qualified as one of the least. He was disinterested in school. He wore wrinkled clothes. His hair was constantly messed up. He had a glassy, unfocused stare. He was expressionless. Uh, he had a deadpan, deadpan face. No expressions whatsoever. And his teacher, Miss Thompson, whenever she spoke to him, uh, he would just speak in monosyllables. Uh, mono, monosyllables. He was unattractive, unmotivated. He was distant. Now, Miss Thompson said this, and teachers will always say this. And she said, oh, I, I love all of my students. The truth was, she was being disingenuous. She was just not really being quite truthful. And I'll have to admit, as a teacher, there have been some that I had really some difficulty liking. And when she graded Teddy's papers, she got a perverse pleasure in putting the X's in wrong answers. And when she put an F at the top of the page, she recalled that she would put the F at the top of the paper with a nice red flare to it. Now, if she did, looked at, bothered to look at his record, she would have known better. And then for some reason, one day, she looked at his record. And she looked at what the previous teachers had said about Teddy. <coughs> if I get through this without crying, it'll be a miracle. His first grade teacher said this about Teddy at the end of the year. I've had to do those end of the year reports. Teddy shows promise, but he's working at it uh, with his work and attitude. But he has poor home life. And then she looked at the second grade teacher's report about Teddy. She says Teddy can do better. His mother is seriously ill. He receives little attention at home. And then she looked at the third grade teachers report what she said about Teddy. Teddy is a good boy, but much too serious. Slow learner. His mother died this year. Then he looked, she looked at the fourth grade teacher's report card. Said Teddy is very slow, but well behaved. His father shows no interest. Well, Christmas time came, and elementary teachers, and I'm kind of jealous, I'm a high school teacher, and element, my wife's an elementary teacher, and she always brings home loads of gifts, and I'm lucky if I get a card. Anyway, uh, so, I had it, they've uh, lost their mood, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, uh, but, Christmas came that year, and the children piled up presents like they do my wife, and, and I'll just get the car. All right, anyway, the, the, the student piled up all of these gifts on her desk. Of course, they automatically wanted to open, her, open up their gift. She was surprised that year that Teddy actually even bothered to bring a gift, and it was wrapped in a brown paper bag. A little old, what we would call poke. And of course, when she went to open up his and she pulled it out of the brown paper bag, all the kids giggled. She had enough sense about her to hush them. And then she pulled out a gaudy rhinestone bracelet. And some stones were missing. And a bottle of cheap perfume. And, of course, on cue, the kids went, you know, ah, ooh, wonderful. And she even bothered to put some on, you know, 
but she really didn't appreciate the praise. Well, all the kids filed out for the bus at Christmas time to go home for their 10 days off. But Teddy lingered behind. And he slowly came over and he said to Miss Thompson, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet looks real pretty on you too. I'm glad you like my present. And so he went out and left the room. Thompson was a Christian. She was so devastated by the power of that little boy's words. And she got down on her knees in that classroom and she asked Jesus Christ, please forgive me. Well, when the kids came back from Christmas, Miss Thompson, they, they had a different teacher. Miss Thompson was an agent for God. She worked, worked with every slow student. And she actually got Teddy up and he was ahead of some by the end of the year. Then she didn't see him anymore. And about six years later, Miss Thompson received a letter from Teddy. Dear Miss Thompson, I want you to be the first to know. I will be graduating high school, second in my class. Love, Teddy. Well, four years passed by. And uh, she got another letter from Teddy. And it said, Dear Miss Thompson, they told me I will be graduating first in my class. I want you to be the first to know. The university has not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Teddy. Four years passed by, and she, re she received another letter from Teddy Stollard. And the letter read like this. As of today, I'm Theodore Stollard, M.D. How about that? So I want you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month. The 27th to be exact. I want you to come and sit where my mother would sit if she were alive. You're the only family I have now. Dad died last year. So Miss Thompson went to the wedding. She wore her favorite perfume, wore her favorite bracelet, and sat where her where his mother would have sat. And she was never so honored in her life. Miss Thompson discovered something. Love, when it is given forth, true love, when it's given forth, heals two people. It heals the person that receives the love, and it heals the person that gives the love. Amen. I want you to know something today. She bestowed love upon one that was considered the least. I ask you in this week of revival and the weeks to come, who in this community has looked down upon that's considered the very least, that you could show love to them, witness to them of the gospel, the, you know, the love of God, see them saved, disciple them, and make them great in the body of Christ. Who is it in the community that you could do that for? Who is it you could help to be made to be one of the greats? That's, I said, primarily for the church. But now I want to talk with you who might be here without Jesus Christ. I'm asking you tonight. If Christ were to come tonight, would you go to heaven? Or will you go to hell? The Bible says, as I quoted last night, and, and if, he says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, 
while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. I know asking you to do something publicly is a difficult thing. But Jesus, when he did everything for you, he did it publicly. Did you know that? He never did anything in secret. He did it publicly. You say, preacher, you, you don't know what I've done. Hmm. I am the least. Of all the people here. Apostle Paul, I'm fond of saying, my wife started hearing about it. Apostle Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners, and I said, The Apostle Paul never met my preachers. I am the least. But you know what? You've come to a church tonight where all of us feel like we're the least. We're just sinners saved by grace. Amen. And we want you to know. The love that Jesus has for you. I, I remember one account where this leper, by the way, leprosy was a type of sin. And this leper came up to Jesus and he said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. Thou can make me clean. You know what Jesus said? I mean, what most people do in, the, in those days. Most people would, would run, and of course the leper was supposed to put his hand over his lip and say, unclean, unclean. That's not Jesus didn't run from lepers. And one day he reached down and touched my creatures in this leper, this spiritual leper, my creatures. And just like that leper, he said, I said, Lord, if you will, you could make me clean. And you know what he said, Brother Jack? He said what he said to that leper. He said, I will. And he touched my life. And made me whole. Then I know of a count where this one woman had this issue of blood for 12 years. Spent her whole life's fortune trying to be made whole. And that she heard about Jesus walking through. And, and, and of course Jesus was required under the law to have a blue hem on his robe. A lot of people don't know that. But she said, if I could just touch the blue hem. Blue was the heavenly one. <laughs> Stood for the heavenly one. And she says, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, touch the heavenly one, is what she's saying. If I could just touch the heavenly one, I could be made whole. And she crawled through that great throng of people, and she touched the hem of his garment. And Jesus stopped and said, someone's touched me, for virtue has gone out of me. And the people, he said, who's touched me? And of course, I, I believe to this day, he knew who touched him. And then they said, well, and all these people, and you ask us who touched you? She was afraid. But I'm telling you, don't be afraid of Jesus tonight. Jesus loves you. And he said to that woman with the issue of blood, he says, Woman, by faith has made me whole. And I, I saw another, another young man, a young man coming to Jesus, and he said, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the Bible says, And Jesus beholding him, Loved him. Loved him. I say to you tonight that Jesus beholding you tonight, He loves you. He loves you more than we can love you. He loved you so much that I read to you what Apostle Paul said that He gave Himself for you. He walked, He went into that city. Luke says it this way, steadfastly. His face steadfastly set to do for you and me what we could not do for ourselves. And the motivating power behind all of it is the fact that he loved you. They made fun of him. They mocked him. They uh, sat down to watch him. They said, now, uh, if you can come down from the cross, we'll believe. But you know, Jesus said, I'm not coming down from the cross. That's really by his actions what he was saying. He's saying, because I love you. I'm dying for you. I don't want you to know not to be afraid tonight of anyone here. I'm going to ask, you know, 
The Bible says that the day is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. About a week ago or so, I went to the funeral of a young man who was only 20 years old. I had met the former student. And I've done that many, many times. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Don't be afraid of coming forward and accepting Christ in front of these people. Because we're all the least. <laughs> Someone has helped us, lifted us up. And that's Jesus Christ, by the way. And you know what? If you come and accept Jesus Christ tonight, we're going to rejoice with you. Just like Miss Thompson rejoiced with you. We're going to rejoice with you. Will you come tonight to accept Jesus Christ on the terms of the gospel? Or will you reject his love that he's offered? You know, people wonder, they say, why, why, if God is a God of love, why then would he punish someone? And the Bible says, uh, uh, He that believeth in the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. God the Father is a very proud Father. He's right to be. He had a son. He says, I'll die for all. I love them and I'll die for all of them. He has the right to be proud of his son. If you walk out that door, the Bible also says, the wrath of God is not at the point. You can either have the love of God or the wrath of God. I'll take that love any day, any day. He wants to give you eternal life tonight. Will you come and be saved tonight? Song We love you tonight.